Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our webinar. Uh, my name is Kara, I'm with Hustle Fund. And here on the screen, we also have Eric Vaughn, who are our featured speaker, one of the founders of Hustle Fund and also uh, an investor at Hustle Fund. Awesome. Um, a big thank you, Kara, for helping to put this together. And then also a huge thank you to everyone here today for joining. So it's 11 o'clock Pacific, my time. Uh, that means it's 2, 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, probably really late in the night in Asia and other places that you might be showing up to. So uh, my apologies in advance for the next hour where you could be doing basically anything else besides listening to someone like myself talk about pitch decks. So my goal is to make this very informative and also um, entertaining too. So uh, a little bit of background just before we start on who I am and what we do at Hustle Fund. So um, I'm one of the co-founders of Hustle's Fund. I spent about 15 years as an operator before I launched uh, this VC fund with uh, my co-founder Elizabeth and my other GP, Sheehan, uh, about three years ago. So I've had a lot of horrible experiences as a founder, just like many of you have had, in uh, pitching. So you know, early on, uh, when I was just starting my career as a founder, had no idea what I was doing, had all sorts of assumptions about uh, what investors were actually looking for when it came to the materials I was putting together, how I was communicating my narrative, et cetera. And what I wanted to do today was uh, you know, spend some time with you to walk through, I think, my mindset, because I can only speak my own truth, but hopefully I can speak the truth of a lot of my colleagues as well about what it means to uh, put together a really good pitch deck. Uh, perfect is a strong word. I know that's the clickbait title that we use to draw you into this, but let's just say pretty good would be a nice outcome for today. Um, a bit about Hustle Fund. So we're a venture capital firm based in San Francisco and Singapore. We're uh, pre-seed stage investors, which means that our most favorite co-investors into this really early tranche of capital tends to be your Uncle Bob, your mom and dad, maybe a couple of angels, maybe a couple of friends. Very few VC funds, um, but we, we love being with the founders really early. And we believe that um, in, a, in a really core thesis um, in our fund that we're trying to prove in our model and the founders that we support is that great hustlers look like anyone and can come from anywhere, full stop. Regardless of what your background or pedigree or whatever you have, if you know how to execute well and with high velocity and are building software, uh, we're, we'd love to speak with you. So let's put that all aside now and talk about the topic at hand. So. All right, I'd like to begin by uh, going through a persona exercise. <clears throat> so for those of you who may have experiences in building products or work like a product manager like I did earlier in my career, uh, personas are a really good way to start to think about uh, this process of building a great pitch deck. So the idea behind that is you want to create some sort of um, mythical character of your ideal intended target for uh, the solution or service or, or, or product that you're trying to build. So uh, let's say that I was creating like a, a reusable coffee mug uh, company. You know, maybe I want to have a persona of like someone that's like Kara, you know, a woman in late 20s uh, and uh, more kind of hip, you know, comes from like a, a place in like Southern California, whatever. I'm not going to provide too many details about Kara's backstory, right? But that's something that our team can then use as like a de design um, archetype that we can solve towards. And when we think about the website, think about whatever we're trying to do to sell this delicious mug of coffee right now, which I'm going to take a sip of very soon. So in this case, let's talk about the persona of the investor whom you're going to be pitching to. So uh, I know the camera plays a little bit of tricks, but I'm actually kind of a short dude. I'm like five foot seven. So imagine a guy like me, who's like three inches, maybe four inches taller, right? So like basically the height that I always wanted to be, like let's call it like 5'11 or something or six feet tall. Um, probably a wider Asian man, because let's get real, like this is a very myopic industry of venture capitalists. And let's talk about VC personas specifically. Instead of this really cool hustle fund branded t-shirt, there's a Patagonia vest that's covering it, okay? And then you can't see my feet right now, but I am actually wearing Allbirds shoes. So that, 
that's kind of like the, the uniform, like Patagonia vest, Auburn shoes, okay? In addition to that, um, you know, let's say that uh, I, I have a really strong traditional background that every um, Asian mom would be proud of, right? I graduated from a top Ivy League school. Um, I worked at McKinsey or Boston Consulting Group or one of those really fancy consulting shops or maybe Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, one of those great banks. After two or three years, I decided to apply to business school. I went to Harvard Business School, right? Or Stanford Graduate School of Business. And then uh, I graduated. Uh, I was able to land in an awesome associate level post MBA VC role at like an NEA or Sequoia or any number of top firms. And uh, maybe I was able to work myself up to partner. Maybe at some point I decided to break off and start my own fund. And here I am right now in my imaginary persona office. I got this beautiful minimalist uh, desk in front of me with some sort of like rare wood, right? I'm in uh, Sand Hill Road perhaps, or maybe in South Park, which is where we are right now uh, in San Francisco. And uh, I'm sipping on my, this coffee literally cost me $4.80 this morning. And all it is, is just a freaking cup of coffee. Okay, so that already, I, I can go into like why that makes me so idi like idiotic already. Uh, so, all right, I'm drinking this coffee. Let's say that I'm in Sand Hill Road, and I swear I'm gonna wrap up this persona exercise. It's Thursday afternoon, 4.30 p.m., okay? Right down the road at, on, uh, in Menlo Park is this hotel called the Rosewood. And the Rosewood has a bar called Madeira. So if you know anything about Madeira Bar on a Thursday night, it is straight popping for its happy hour that night. There's a lot of recent, some of you are actually calling it out in the chat. I'm not gonna say those words because it's inappropriate for me to say, but let's just say it's a good place to meet people. Maybe those who are in a more vulnerable state that you, know, you would like to get to know better. I have been married for a long time. I've been with my wife for 20 years. I do not know anything about that life. I promise you, be if you're watching, I swear. I've never gone to Cougar Night, okay? All right, I said the words. So, okay, 4.30, okay? Happy hour is about to start in one hour, all right? So all I'm thinking about, and like as I'm rubbing my Patagonia vest and this, the very, very soft rare wood of my desk is like, all right, I wanna get to inbox zero. Let's get to, uh, I'm gonna go into my superhuman email clients because that's the best way to get to inbox zero. I actually do this as well. And like, let me clear out the next 50 emails in the next 40 minutes so I can head on over there, you know, and then uh, buy a, a $17 cocktail, right? Maybe it's a little bit more at this point. But I swear I've not been to Cougar Night, okay. So uh, uh, at this point, uh, I'm looking at my uh, email inbox and I have 30 pitches, 40 pitches. They're just in, in order, you know, of like, you know, I, got, I wanna just clear this out. So you, the founder, are sitting in my inbox, maybe from a warm referral, maybe like Kara is a partner in another fund and so like, you, know, you must talk to my friend Joe. You know, we've been friends forever. Here's a warm introduction to Joe. Joe sends an email deck or whatever, and it's sitting in my inbox. I'm thinking about cocktails in the bar. I'm thinking I only have 45 minutes and I have 30 emails to go through, 30 pitch decks. So Here's the thing to think about. So I'm done with this persona. I know that I kind of, I, I like to get a little bit, I, I fall into this uh, pit of describing this person a little bit too much lately. But the first thing to think about is the reality of what a VC is doing in, in, in that role, in this position. This is actually not that far removed from what happens every day. Like we're not drinking every day, but like there's a huge queue of founders deals that are often sitting in our inbox and need to clear out. So the first assumption in this persona exercise based on what I described is do not assume anyone's going to read your deck. And we're going to talk about that more. The second thing, though, is assume that you only get 30 to 60 seconds, maybe 90 seconds or two minutes if you're like really interesting, per deck review. So me as a VC, as I'm sipping my $4.80 coffee, you know, getting ready for the night, like I'm going to spend like a minute at most looking at your deck. And this relates to why you don't read the deck, okay? So... Um, let me pause here because I just described this persona. I don't know if this is a good time, Kara, to highlight like a question or two, but I'm going to sort of transition into how this relates to the construction 
of putting together your, your pitch deck because this persona I think, I think is something that not enough people think about before they actually begin putting pen to paper or fingers to keyboard and constructing their, their assets. Yeah, Carrie, are you seeing anything uh, relevant in terms of what I just said? Most of the questions are um, specific to the actual construction of the deck. So I say dive in. Okay, let's do that. So, okay, thanks for bearing with me for that last 10 minutes of uh, craziness. So <clears throat> um, let me actually start by uh, talking about like a, a really quick anecdote here, even more to go down this, but I swear this relates to the pitch deck construction. So um, very briefly in my career, I worked as an analyst at the Boston Consulting Group. So I was one of those guys who also graduated from like one of those schools and went to work at one of these consulting shops as well. I only lasted three months before they, they basically fired me. That's a longer story. Um, we, we talked about that over drinks at Madeira Bar at some point. So uh, what happened though was in those three months, I learned a really important lesson when it comes to the very first principle of pitch deck construction. So in my first attempts at creating pitch decks, my job was primarily to um, uh, build these long decks for executives to present to their all hands meetings at these top tech companies or something like they're, they're roundly being criticized by my team is like, this is terrible until they actually told me the secret to a really good uh, deck from, from this consulting work. They said, you only need to focus on the headlines. Okay. Assume no one's going to read the contents of the slide. It's only about the title headlines of the deck. Okay. Now, if you guys have to leave right now for whatever reason at this webinar, you've essentially have gotten 70% of today's uh, like takeaway, which is this is all about the headlines. So let's talk a little bit more about like what, what actually is like the headlines I was trained to do and why the story even is relevant to what you guys are doing in pitching these VCs. So a couple thoughts here. <clears throat> um, the first is that uh, I was taught that a good headline is a standalone sentence. Okay, the sentence in itself is directing the point of the slide. Okay, all the content below the headline, that title, I, I use title and headline interchangeably, by the way, throughout this, uh, um, this talk. All that is going to be, all the content is going to just be supporting evidence to whatever that title is saying. Okay, and when you read the titles of the slides and just scan title, 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 while I'm drinking my coffee in Rosewood or whatever. It's like, the, you, I should be able to get 70 to 80% of what your company does and why it's unique, just from that alone, okay? That is like a 30 second exercise of just reading headlines. So headlines are a standalone sentence. When you read the headlines one after the other, it should read into a cohesive paragraph that essentially describes what you are doing, okay? And I want to start with an exercise and, and talking about this, this email, like three artifacts, actually. An email deck, which is like a summarized version, maybe teaser deck of what you guys do. A, a blurb, which is like a couple sentence description of what uh, you can include in like a forwardable intro email, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then a longer deck, which I'm going to actually talk the least about. And I'll explain why in a moment. So let's bring it back to this persona I just described. Like, I actually believe that uh, in an interesting cognitive science um, theory that I remember reading in college once, which basically concluded that people who are similar to you, you're going to be attracted to. So an example is like, my wife and I, like we're both Korean and have like immigrant stories. So there's probably a natural affinity towards each other because we can just automatically understand our backgrounds, right? Or maybe like, Kara is a super huge uh, San Francisco Giants fan. I like the Giants too. So we're attracted to each other because we can talk about baseball as well, right? Whatever it is. Now, the cognitive science here that applies to the persona I just described is VC with this very specific kind of career trajectory pedigree is there's a very high likelihood that a good number of the VCs you are going to be pitching come from this persona that I just talked about and were trained in the exact same way of constructing, constructing a pitch deck. So my theory that I'm gonna just like seed for you, for you all today in the audience is that when you can construct a, a pitch deck that is modeled after the exact same way that people at McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, Goldman Sachs were trained in constructing their own pitch decks, when someone just opens that up with this background, that's gonna produce an edge for you because the, I think the internal dialogue is going to say like, oh my gosh, like uh, this person is just like me, right? 
And I think that's where the initial attraction is going to begin. When you just like the first thing that I do when I look at a deck is I just, I don't even read anything. I just like scroll really quickly to just see if I can get a gist based off of like the pictures or like some keywords and so forth. But from that initial 10 seconds, I think I can see people who are just like me. I can pick out someone who is trained at Boston Consulting Group, uh, just like I was in like about 10 seconds. So initial attraction. Okay. So, um, so, okay. I, hopefully that makes sense so far around like how the persona ties to, uh, the pitch deck, uh, construction and why I think that actually produces some basis for higher levels of attraction. And I think that actually does yield into higher level of conversion on edges over time. Right. Like, so if you can find ways that like give you a 5% edge, uh, over other people, um, that compounds over time and makes the whole fundraising process much easier. Okay. So let me move on here. Let me talk about like an actual example of this. So uh, let me give you the most common pitch deck that I see every day, okay? And this is for the email pitch deck and we'll again talk about the blurb and then maybe a longer deck a little bit later, if there's time. So the most common pitch deck is like this. Slide one, team. Slide two, problem. Slide three, solution. Slide four, market, slide, slide, traction. Those are the headlines of each of those slides. So as I'm wearing my Patagonia vest and like rubbing myself because it's very fluffy and then uh, I'm drinking my coffee, do you think that just on this basis of loan from this review, I can just read the headlines and understand anything what you do, right? And the answer is absolutely not, right? You've given me no concept. Now you are forcing me to do work. So let's take a step back on the cognitive science part. There's something that, that I, lately I've just been reading a lot of cognitive science because I, I discovered I should have majored in this stuff a long time ago. There's a part of your brain, which is a little bit more reptilian, that is about like, you know, basically placing stereotypes on people like, oh yeah, like this thing that Kara's talking to me about is like this, or, or she's referring to this argument as that, right? It's a really lazy kind of center for survival that takes very little energy for me to do. Like I can just like sit back, relax, and there's very little brain function happening. When you're forcing me to go to higher orders of thinking in my brain, which is like generally where the neocortex is, that requires more expenditure of energy from your body. And as a result, naturally humans do not like to be forced to move into the neocortex to do really critical thinking whenever they can be lazy. Already, when you think about that persona, you know, if I'm sitting back, beautiful table, Patagonia vest, all bird shoes, sipping my, my $4.80 coffee, and then thinking about the bar, like I'm, in a, I'm not in a mode where I'm actually ready to, uh, to engage my neocortex, right? So um, when you give me a headline like that, problem, solution, market traction, you're making me read now. You're making me trying to actually do critical thinking on like what is the content actually now on these slides? Like how, what is this like entire story about that I have to construct myself through, through analysis, right? By, by actually doing real work, which a VC should theoretically be doing. But that is a recipe for failure because laziness will always beat critical thinking, at least at this stage. Now, later on, when you have the engagement and interest of the VC, you know, like, sure, they're gonna put in plenty of hours together, like you as well as the VC, to really understand the businesses and the nuance. But this initial kind of attraction is really what matters. All right. Now, I think you guys are ready to hear an example of a good pitch deck, right? And Eric? And, yeah, go ahead. Someone asked if you could ex um, give an example of, of a headline. Um, Aha! Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that, whoever said that, because uh, that's exactly what I was going to do next. So I gave you examples of terrible headlines, like these one, one word, like problem solution market contraction. So let's go through this exercise. I'm going to make up an entirely fake company. It may exist. I don't know. I'm just making it up right now. Okay. <clears throat> Let's say that you, that you and I, audience member, are the founders of um, a, a company that basically monitors infant sleep to prevent SIDS. So I'm a, I'm a relatively new dad. I got young babies. When I had my first kid, I was obsessed by SIDS. SIDS stands for a Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And it's, it's basically the, the phenomenon of you, you walk into your baby's room and then they're dead the next morning because they just stopped breathing in the middle of the night. Uh, it's random, it's kind of crazy, and it's like every new parent's worst nightmare. Um, by the way, the theory behind why this happens is like possibly your baby rolls over before he or she's able to roll back and suffocate, or there's like a stuffed animal or a pillow. You should never put any of those objects in, 
in a, a baby's crib before they can actually turn over and so forth. Um, so, but SIDS is crazy. And there's a period of your life as a new parent where you're just like kind of obsessed over this for like a week or two, right? Before you're just like, well, life is what it is. So um, we're, we've created a, a product. Let's say it's a wearable sock that you can put on like an infant's foot and then uh, you'll monitor vitals and like it'll send off alarms if like something's going wrong, especially related to breathing. Okay, that is the product. So uh, let me give you an example of like what I think this email deck pitch deck should look like. So I'm gonna make up all the stats, all the numbers. I have no idea what this industry is or how big it is. So problem, this is my first slide. It's gonna be every year, 32,000 brand new infants suddenly die in their sleep from uh, sudden infant death syndrome. Okay, so I'm sort of laying out like the scope of a problem of like, wow, there's like tens of thousands of babies that are dying, right? Um, so uh, let's talk about market slide next. So that headline could be something like, in the next year, there's gonna be 1.6 million new American parents having their first child, and they are freaked out about preventing uh, sudden infant death syndrome, right? So very large market. Uh, so we did problem market sol solution next, okay? Which is our team has created a simple wearable sock that tracks the vitals of infants and lets parents know in real time if an issue happens or breathing problems happen, something along with that, okay? Um, traction, let's do that next. Uh, last month, we, ha we ran a Kickstarter and got 42,000 pre-orders of our products, even before we started the manufacturing. So it's showing like, oh my gosh, there's real product market. There's, there's, there's so much uh, uh, product there, or uh, a product pull there. And then finally team, which is, um, you know, the three co-founders spent 10 years building high-tech wearables at Under Armour prior to solving this problem of saving babies, okay? So if you feel like there, so just based on those headlines alone, you should be able to like get a good sense just by reading one after the other what the team problem solution market interaction is, right? Not in that order specifically. And I think you get basically 80% of the nuance of this business, right? You know exactly that we're solving this uh, very specific kind of market area problem around infant death. You have a good sense that we actually are real builders and maybe mechanical engineers with all this experience in like a relevant company and so forth. And the goal is when an investor is looking at uh, your email deck and trying to make a basis of whether this is interesting or not, it's not a decision of like, I'm ready to invest now. That shouldn't be the goal. The goal is actually, I want to learn more. And just a response that says like, let's set up time. All right, so that's it. Let's set up time, okay? So, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Kira, it looks like you have uh, something for me here. Yeah, let's, um, let's clarify a couple of questions that a lot of people seem to have. Um, question number one, um, earlier we talked about keeping the content relatively short. Those sentences felt a little long for some folks. Can you address that? Yeah, so first of all, they're pretty long because I just made them up and they're kind of crappy. But the second is like, I think that there's a general rule of thumb that if it looks, if you run the exercise with like a friend or, or someone else and they can generally read pretty briskly, let's say 30 seconds through all the headlines, that should be okay for something like an email artifact, email deck artifact. The second thing too is like for me, and we do this with our own pitch decks, like when we fundraise, like I think that two lines of text on the headline is perfectly fine. Now, if you can tell your story in an even shorter, more pithier way than I did, it's even better, right? So the shorter the better, but I think two lines is totally fine. Um, but don't like include a paragraph description at the header, right? This, this Again, like email deck is not necessarily something where you want to be comprehensive. You're just trying to show, um, I think the strongest points of like the main pillars behind the right pitch deck. So what do I mean by the main pillars? And this is something I probably should have been really explicit about. And this gives me an opportunity to use the blue white bar pen that I brought with me today. So. Uh, by the way, I sold this for my son, so he's going to be really angry when he sees this video later. There's only five things that you need to talk about uh, in a good email deck, right? So the first aspect is team, problem, 
solution, market, ET, and traction. <clears throat> so team, this is a, this is basically like, you know, is there, is this team, like, here's what I'm thinking about when I'm looking at the, these email decks or just any deck really. It's like, does the team have the relevant skills to, to solve the problem or be in this industry that they've chosen, right? So a good example would be like, I was a mechanical engineer at Toyota for 10 years building like artificial intelligence. Now me and my, my buddies are creating a, a fully autonomous vehicle startup. Like that's not something I would invest in, but like it's, it, I can see why there's relevance in terms of like you guys have built stuff together. You um, understand this space and have like the, the requisite knowledge to proceed. Problem. This is a, a important one. So, you know, this is a succinct description of the exact problem that you're trying to solve. In the case of seed investments, I think it's like, it's not allowed enough to just have a really good problem statement headline. It's also very important to understand and have at least a back pocket explanation of how did you arrive at this problem? So for example, if Kara and I are starting a, a service for Uber for families, like we want to be able to let kids under two years old with their parents, like ride around town very easily without the car seats. That sounds cool. It sounds like something I would use, but I'd like to understand how you arrived to actually this is a problem. Did you do like customer development interviews? How many people did you speak to, right? Like what, what mechanisms did you do? Did you, uh, did you uh, use to just like isolate this into like a very, very specific problem? Solution is a product or, or service that you're providing. So good opportunity to show a screenshot, uh, show some like real use case or testimonials and so forth. Market. This is a sizing, uh, largely a sizing opportunity for you to show that this is something that is venture backable. So ideally your market is measured in the billions of dollars and you can make the case that uh, is large enough to support a venture backable outcome whereby if I accept your money as a founder, I can turn it into extraordinary amounts of money uh, for your investors, for you, and of course myself as a founder. And then finally traction. This one's actually the most optional one for us at Hustle Fund. So there, this one really varies from firm to firm. But if we're doing pre-seed stage investments where we're the, like we're investing alongside your mom, then I don't really think it makes, we're not gonna have very high expectations. You're already hitting like $100,000 a month in revenue or even 10,000 or possibly even 1,000. That tends to come a little bit later. <clears throat> some firms get really hung up on this though. And so if they do and you know your audience, then you may wanna show something that uh, around user acquisition, sales, pilots, logos, like Google's our design partner or something like that. Okay, so this is essentially like the underlying framework of like a good email deck is just hitting up these five things. In fact, a great email deck could just be five slides. But again, do not submit just these one words. Turn these into sentences, just like the, the wearable sock infant monitoring company we just created. Hopefully that clarifies. Carol. It does, it does. And um, Eric, you touched on two things that I think we can um, cross out two quick questions. Um, one is, this might be kind of a small detail, but are investors looking for those words that you've listed behind you to be on the slides or could they just, re could our founders simply replace those words with the headlines that you mentioned before? Yeah, this is a great mechanical point. You don't need to include these words at all, right? I, I think it, so long as you understand the pillar that you're trying to answer in your deck, that's fine. Just don't, don't include it, totally good. Perfect. And then um, our most upvoted question so far ha has uh, related actually to one of those pillars, um, which is this. Uh, in pre-seed, founders are uh, generally a key part of the decision-making process. Uh, what do you look for in the pitch deck on this front and how can it stand out? Yeah, so I'm really glad um, the person who asked that question asked this question because if I were to stack rank like the most important to the least important, let's start with the least important. Traction, I think is the least important for us. It might be different for different funds. You'll have to do your research on that. Um, problem and solution, like, are more important for me, but still kind of on the lower end. I mean, like, a problem, a great problem statement is a great problem statement, and there's always ways to manufacture good reasons for how you came to this, right? Sometimes it's a good example. So for problems, sometimes it's a good opportunity to share like a personal narrative. So we, there's a company in our portfolio that does 3D uh, prosthetics, for example. And the, one of the founders lost a leg uh, earlier in life. And, and that, you know, that's pretty interesting from an emotional perspective. Solution is whatever you've built so far. Team, it's really all about team. So if I were to say that, like, how we're stack ranking, 60% of our decisions is going to be just from the team slide. 
right? So a couple, a couple things out about that. So one is just like, if you guys have a strong team, that should be slide number one always, right? Why waste time? I'm sipping coffee with my Patagonia vest. Why would it make me wait till the very end to learn about your team when it's the most important thing anyway? Uh, at least for seed decks. Now, a quick aside, if you're doing like a growth stage deck, which is not, not what we're talking about today, I think the team actually matters a little bit less. It's still important, but, but you have numbers. It's like, look at our five years of trailing profitability and EBITDA and like it's going up and to the right and you know like, okay, like this is like a spreadsheet exercise. It's not even like a pitch. So um, what makes a good team slide? Okay, I think there's really two things that I think are critical. So the first is, and I can't touch on it, is relevant skills. So this one's a little bit harder to define, but I, I can only share it with like uh, the example of like the sock company. So if I see that you have like a mechanical engineering degree, you've worked with textiles and fabrics, you know, like uh, you, you've actually been to a mill where like these Under Armour smart clothes are, are created and have all the distribution relationships, uh, went to like fancy schools even maybe in some cases, we don't care about that as much at Hustle Club. Um, then that really makes sense. But let's say it's like me and Kara and we're both like, Customer, like, like customer success managers at like a, a software business, but she and I are now starting an autonomous vehicle company. That seems like too much of a leap. And that will be noticed, right? Because we, we don't have engineering degrees and we might have great ideas and we still could be successful, but it's just, there's too much of a logical leap there. So that's relevant skills. The second is um, uh, history. So not every, VC fund is gonna obsess over this, but I actually increasingly am falling more and more focused on this, which is if there's co-founders, and it's okay if you don't have co-founders, that's fine, this is less relevant, but if you do have co-founders, it's really great when you can demonstrate that you've built products together or built companies together before, or at least have some sort of longevity of the relationship. The, the allergic reaction I have are marriages of convenience, where maybe you solve for skills, like Kara is a super dope mechanical engineer, in like autonomous vehicle space before this, let's say I was like a like the top salesperson for like Tesla or something, right? Like it sounds great from like a skills perspective to build that kind of a company, but uh, we don't have any history working together. That to me is a recipe for co-founder breakup, mismatch of personalities, and co-founder breakup is actually one of the top causes that we see of uh, of teams breaking up. So when you're thinking about constructing your team slide, I think a headline that speaks to relevant skills and history is good. So in our case at Hustle Fund, when we pitch ourselves, we talk about a couple things. We say um, first that every single general partner has built a company and scaled it and sold it, okay? So I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not actually giving you our exact headline. The second thing that we say is that we've been friends for 20 years. So I met with Elizabeth and she and my two other GPs about 20 years ago, my freshman year of college. All right, so that essentially is my way of positioning Hustle Fund's team on the headline on skill and longevity of working relationship. I hope that answers the question. It does, thank you. And, and uh, you also answered a lot of other questions about um, you know, solo founders versus co-founders. Um, do you think, another question that I'm seeing is, um, what about a board? Do you think an advisor, is this something that uh, founders should consider including? So yeah, I got two thoughts on that. So. If you have really fancy logos, uh, just full stop of like, you know, fancy places you work at school or, or where you work for or your schools or whatever, that's always good to include. Advisors are kind of a similar version of the logo, right? So if like, like a Bill Gates or something is like closely advising you, you know, that's, that is something, it's notable. Now, let me sort of take a slightly different turn on this question. It's just like at pre-seed and seed stage, I really don't hope you have a board, right? It's okay to have advisors. I don't, I really hope you don't have a formal board because it's way too early for that. This is like pure R and D stage. This is your time to be extra creative and ex experimental. You haven't found product market fit yet. And I think that board is more appropriate for maybe series A and beyond where like you're now like professionalizing your business and so forth. So um, don't position it as like a board of directors, even if it's really informal on that kind of a slide, because that's like, that'll signal kind of like a weirdness for like most early stage founders, at least in the Silicon Valley context. And Eric, what if, um, what if the founders don't have fancy degrees and ha what if they haven't worked in at fancy companies? <laughs> what if they don't haven't really worked much at all? What would you recommend there? So 
these are our, in some ways, some of our favorite founders that we support at Hustle Fund. Now, like we have plenty of people with like too many degrees and pedigrees and all that stuff too in our portfolio, and that's perfectly fine as well. But um, <clears throat> the, I think showing a history of hustle in some capacity is, is, is important. So let's say that you're like, you're fresh out of college, right? You haven't had real work experience yet. Um, maybe it wasn't even like a, one of those Ivy League schools or whatever, right? That, that's totally fine. But it's like still demonstrating a track record of your ability to hustle and, and be super resourceful and produce huge results for be helpful. So a good example of that is like, let's say that you are in charge of the student entrepreneurship conference in college. You know, what did you do to like land that sponsorship money? How much was it? Like, do you have a teammate who's a co-founder now that you guys are working together? How big was the event? Was there press coverage? You know, it's, you, it takes a little bit more massaging, but if you just show that you have great adaptability, growth mindset, and some history with your co-founders if you have some, I think that's basically all the strengths that you've gotten. And this is actually a, a, one of the cases where I may actually move the team slide to lower. Right? It's not to say that you're weak because you, know, you still have to make the investment on the team, but maybe you can build up the narrative of what you're building first before showing the team because frankly, it's not gonna be as strong as what a lot of other VCs are gonna be looking at in, in the next email or the next email or the next email. Again, this is something that um, I really wanna harp on, which is like, what I didn't understand as a founder is I thought like, and this is such a loaded term, but like, I'm gonna just say it, it's like, I thought I was like a unique snowflake, right? I was just like this, this, this really singularly interesting person working on this singularly interesting industry. But the reality is my pitch deck was stacked 10 above and 10 below other emails. And I had 30 seconds to 60 seconds. And I never really put enough effort into trying to make myself stand out because I didn't understand that as well. And maybe I couldn't have ever stood out, right? So just know that like, it's not you that's being judged for you, it's being you judged from the other 20 people I just saw and the next 20 people I'm gonna see afterwards as well. All right? so think about that framing as well when it comes back to the persona. Um, if it's cool to care, I'd like to actually uh, talk about really quickly, at least the blurb, uh, in conjunction with this email deck and the longer deck, okay? So, and Eric, is this the blurb that people will send in an email with their short deck? Yeah, you got it. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, I remember my very first date with my wife. I went uh, and uh, again, I met her 20 years ago and I knew immediately that this is the person for me. Uh, side note, she was dating some other jackass at the time and I had to wait three years for her to break up with him. But then I swooped in and then finally we got together, right? So it, it worked out for us. So you didn't need to know that, but I just wanted to share that. So my first date with my wife was actually our junior college. And then um, I took her out to like some sort of like pho noodles, bar or something in Mountain View, California. And um, that first date was really fun. And I remember it because, you know, I was attracted to her. I think she was attracted to me, I hope. And then, uh, but it was, uh, we were both like nervous and excited at the same time. So, you know, we tried to present our best self. I, you know, showered, I put on a nicer shirt. Maybe at the time it was a nicer Patagonia vest, you know. And then, uh, you know, it was, it was a good kind of first date impression. And then we built from there. So, the reason why I share this is like, when you think about uh, your artifacts, you need to think of it by progressive discovery stage. Now on day one, when I was dating my wife, I didn't share with her over a bowl of noodles that like there's a history of mental illness in my family. I have proclivities towards certain kinds of cancer on my dad's side. Like, you know, I, I'm in debt and like, you know, you know like, like, or I have a gambling problem or something like that. Like that's not something that is sexy to share on the first date. You know, you need to work up to that progressive discovery. And I do think that these artifacts actually map to like a different kind of progressive discovery for your, your VC as well. So the email blurb, which we'll talk about in a moment, is, is like the introduction that shows one or two of the most interesting highlights of your business. Okay, and the goal for that email deck, when I forward that along as your VC to another VC or another angel investor, is a response that's just simply interesting, tell me more, okay? Next, I'm gonna send the email deck. Sometimes that's actually included with um, the blurb itself. That's very often practice. And then, you know, provides a little bit more context, the team problem solution market and traction, right? Now I can get like a 60, 70% understanding of what this business is all about. The goal for that response is cool. Uh, make the introduction, right? Again, like blurb and email deck are kind of the same thing in a lot of cases now. 
And then finally, there's this longer deck, which we're not really going to talk about today, that is an extension of all these things, right? You, this is where you can provide a lot more nuances about what this business is all about and so forth. And uh, the headlines are still important there. So do the same headline exercise that I just described with like complete sentences. But in that case, you are controlling the narrative. Hopefully you're presenting this over a Zoom conference, in person, in a big room. You have a whiteboard too, like me to draw stuff. And then um, the goal for that artifact is, uh, can you, or like, can someone put a comment there that just like made me laugh right now, actually. Uh, it's hyper inappropriate, but I have to give you props for putting that in public form. Uh, but the goal for that longer deck is actually, um, you know, we'd like to invest, right? So progressive discovery, right? Highlight the strongest stuff first, a little bit more context, and then full context that leads to the investment. I do think, so I think a, a mistake that a lot of founders are making is that they're trying to jump to the, the investment thing. There's like, make an intro, here's my full deck, and hopefully I think that, uh, you know, hopefully you'll be able to make a decision in the next week or something to invest. I get a lot of those actually. And it's it's generally a little bit too much. Most, most investors will have a hard time with that Again, like it, it's kind of more neocortex activity when I'm looking at a 50 slide deck. I was just trying to put together like, what is this entire like universe here, right? And can I actually make a basis to decide what this is all about? So, um, uh, so let's talk about the blur for a moment here. So we talked about the headlines and how they should read essentially as like a, a full paragraph uh, back to back, right? So the blurb is, you can take almost like the headlines themselves, but maybe even more condensed. Uh, into a very simple paragraph that describes what you do. So again, pick one or two of the highlights that you think are presenting your business um, in the most favorable way that could draw initial interest. So some description of the business, maybe like focusing on like the market or focusing on the traction or, or the team, whatever it is. And then uh, generally a contact information at the very bottom, right? Now the goal of this blurb, and th so this isn't like something that I want to talk a lot about, but the goal of the blurb, blurb is that it's a very important artifact. In fact, maybe the most important one because it's meant to be forwarded along. So um, let's talk about like um, the appropriate etiquette for forwarding your intro blurb. The goal is to make your investor or someone in your network that wants to support you to not do any work. So if founder Kara, whom I love, like wants to like get some introductions from me, and she just says, Eric, can you introduce me to like some of your favorite investors for my company? And that's it. That's like a lot of neocortex work. I'm just like, shit, like uh, who, uh, what am I going to say? Right? Like, like you're making me do like, you know, three minutes of typing to, for each person copy and paste. Like that, that sounds like a lot of work and it is a lot of work actually, especially since venture capitalists have to make, you know, dozens of introductions a day. Like that stuff really does add up. Um, so instead, if Kara said to me, Eric, I'd like to introduce you to uh, introduce me to Elizabeth, just forward this email along and it just shows like that paragraph and says like, hi, Elizabeth, like this is the company, here's how they reach me. And then I can just forward that with a note that says interested, question mark, way better. Now, another thing about these intros is uh, there's another mistake that I just mentioned uh, in, in that first example, of, like Kara just asking me for a blanket intro to anyone. That is a recipe for inaction. When you ask someone to say, to, to do something like, um, hey, just forward this along to any uh, person that might be interested in my company, most people are gonna be doing nothing with it. And it's not that they don't want to help you, it's because it's hard and a lot of work to think about who are like the dozen people that would be perfect for this. We made the exact same mistake when we were fundraising our first fund in the same thing. Like we had people who invested in us um, some cases small checks, some cases larger checks, but no one would respond to when we included our blurb and said, like, can you just pass this along to anyone who's interested in your network? Then we discovered a different kind of trick that produced a near 100% response rate. It was instead of Kara saying, like, forward this blurb to anyone in your network, she changed it to say, Eric, can you forward this email to one person in your network who would be a great fit? for care fund or for care company, right? That was utterly game changing for us. Instead of like asking for the universe, you ask for one person. So it still requires a little bit of neocortex work, but it felt psychologically like a small, small ask, okay? And that small ask uh, yielded so many more investor introductions for us. Same thing needs to be done with you all, right? 
Don't make people work. Don't make people think and only ask for one thing. Okay. Not the universe. And I think that this will actually ironically accelerate your fundraising process quite a bit more, at least the leads. I can't guarantee you the conversions that's up to you, but at least the leads. Um, before we sort of, uh, wrap up here, Kara, to just like exclusively talk about the Q and A, because I want to make sure we reserve a lot of time. I want to sort of share my last sort of perspective on pitch decks. Okay. You'll notice that I didn't prepare a pitch deck for you today. I'm just looking at the camera and we're speaking like this. Okay. Whenever we go fundraising with our own fund at Hustle Fund, we actually prepare, we don't bring a pitch deck. I usually like to sit down and say like, Hey, you know, I have a deck prepared, but what if we just you know, talk like real people here and I can ex explain my journey. I want to hear yours. And then let's, let's just have a real conversation. I'll just send you that stuff later. Right? So when you get to your in-person meeting, after you've made it through your blurb, after you've made it through your email, email deck, you know, and the meeting setup, and now you're sitting in the boardroom, this isn't going to work for everyone, but I challenge you all to not go into that, to go into that meeting without any materials and just say like, don't take any notes. I'm going to send you all the contacts in the data room later on. Let's just talk like real people. The power dynamic is going to change quite a bit because one, very few founders do this. Okay. It's a little bit gutsy. The second thing though is, you know, when you're in a room, let's pretend this is like a TV monitor that I'm hooked up and my presentation is running and I'm sending off to the side here. Right. Um, a couple of problems right now. Like the first is like, you're going to pay attention to the screen more than you're going to pay attention to me. Right. I'm also going to pay attention to the screen because like, it's a very easy crutch for me to like talk like this. Right. And I'm not reading the room at all. The VCs are also sitting down in chairs while you may be just standing up talking. And it's a really easy, the phone's right in front of you. It's really easy for me to sit back and be like, what is, you know, you know, what's going on here? Just blah, blah, blah. Looking at Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is now. Um, so you are losing a lot of leverage and power dynamics, I think, just by being presenting. Now, that's not to say that you can't like do what I just said and crush it and like go out and leave the room with like a zillion dollars from SoftBank. Like that happens a lot too. But I'm, I'm challenging you to say like, know your material so well, know that you need to just hit these core talking points and make sure that they're covered in like the in-person meeting. And you'll feel that like the, the asymmetry of power of the people on one side of the room and you feels a lot more balanced, right? So that's something that, uh, that I wanted to challenge you about and why I actually like doing this presentation on pitch decks without any deck to hopefully try to demonstrate some of that value. Maybe I did it poorly. You guys can tell us in the survey later on. Let me stop talking though. Kara, I see uh, the, the chat is blowing up with questions. So would love to you know, focus on that for the remaining time. Awesome, thanks so much, Eric, that was great. Um, so we've got on our Q&A, we've got a bunch of questions, like 50 questions here. So why don't we rapid fire some of these in the next 10 minutes? Let's do it. Try and get through a bunch. Okay, uh, how do you explain a complex technical product in a pitch deck to non-technical investors? That's a freaking awesome question. And um, I guess my response is this, which is let's go back to the persona, that person I talked to. You know, uh, this is gonna sound like pandering because it's a pandering statement. Okay, so prepare yourself for a pandering statement from a pandering venture, venture capitalist right now, which is VCs aren't very smart. Most of them aren't, okay? Now there are some brilliant ones who are like hyper specialized, like, yes, I know everything about automotive and uh, like artificial intelligence because I've spent 35 years like, like, like building the theories around this at Harvard and then like putting it into practice and whatever. Like, yes. Okay. There are, there are funds like that where like, they will keep you on your toes because they have such technical niche expertise and I hope that you can find ways getting introduced to those. But if you're talking to the generalists like us, we deal mostly software. The first issue is actually, the first problem with this question is actually you're already talking to the wrong person, right? So like if, if you're trying to get funding for a hyper-technical problem that you think is going to be just really, really complicated to speak to, uh, to the investors to get them to come along, then you're like not really talking about the company, but actually just giving a lecture. So you're losing, I think, a lot of the leverage of this conversation by just spending disproportionate time in teaching the concept before you actually even pitch the opportunity. So... Selection bias, I think, is really important here. It's, uh, making sure that you are uh, talking to investors who seem to have the right kinds of relevant skills to understand your business. So that's part one. 
The second thing is this, let's say that you still go ahead and do it because money's money, right? Like who cares if like Eric is dumb, but if he's got lots of cash and it's like coming out of his ears, then like, let's take some. Um, <clears throat> good rule of thumb is like, you know, my, I'm a big Redditor. If you like the Reddit community and one of my favorite subreddits is explain it like I'm flat, like I'm five, explain it like I'm five, excuse me. So, um, that's basically like this thing where they're like, Oh, explain like the theory of relativity that like a five year old learns that or something. And like people come up with like these pretty amazing examples, right? That's kind of like the level of sophistication. Uh, maybe explain it like I'm 15. It's probably the right level of sophistication you try to solve for, for this kind of complicated uh, thing. So I don't have a really good answer for you other than like, again, the two takeaways of selection bias, make sure that you do some research on funds that have competencies, um, especially on the partnership skill set to understand this. So you don't have to spend time explaining concepts. And the second thing too is like, if you do go ahead and pitch to like a general fund like us, um, that you can just think about that persona with the Patagonia vest and Albert shoes, but they're 15 years old now. Okay. And I think if you can like solve for that kind of persona, you'll have a, a better chance of success. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Um, here's another one. Um, so apparently a lot of the folks who have tuned in um, have companies that really take advantage of network effects, but when they present their decks or send their decks to investors, the feedback is that the unit economics probably aren't good enough, but the founders believe that they are because of the network effects. How can they prove their unit economics in a really quick way in the deck uh, without compromising the actual um, deck or providing too much information? Yeah, um, another good question. And like, frankly, one that I don't have like a really clear response to other than this, which is, um, I'm gonna speak in like uh, a lot a broader, broader kind of perspective first. So there's good news and bad news for today's vintage of, of founders. So back in 2010, everyone lost their mind. Uh, and what I mean by that is like SoftBank came and they're like, we have this thesis where if we plow money into like, a, like a crazy amount of money into these companies, we can create monopolies and squelch out all competition and produce unicorns like a factory, right? The sins of that era are now being reaped, right? So you're seeing like SoftBank's thesis starting to collapse in many use cases. Maybe it'll work out, who knows, but like, I don't think it will. Now, the good news, bad news is that profitability is sexy again. So, oh my gosh, this like very basic concept of economics that a business is meant to be a going concern is back. What is a going concern? More money comes in than leaves, right? I don't think that's changed for like several thousand years, but in Silicon Valley, we get sidelined by science experiments and other kinds of things as well. Now, this doesn't apply to every class of company. Like if, if we're building like a, a, the next generation spacecraft to, to like bring people to Mars, like I don't know how to, first of all, don't apply to us because we have no idea how to assess that. But second is just like, yeah, I don't expect you to be like, you know, operating a really clean profit and loss statement every quarter, right? Like it's going to take years of losses before, you know, $30 billion a year, $30 billion investment later, you've actually achieved like this incredible milestone that unlocks like trillions of opportunity. Right. Um, but when it comes to things like unit economics, like it still needs to be distilled down to explain it like in 15 kind of thing too. Right. And I think like the, the point that you're trying to drive across is that we're on the path, even with these uh, unit economics towards becoming a going concern. Right. Uh, whereby like, you know, at certain inflection point with a certain amount of resources, it does inflect where like this becomes a scalable business. Right. And <clears throat> Sort of like uh, when, when you're having these conversations with, with, uh, with investors who are really rattling on this stuff, you need to come back to that principle and remind them over and over again. It's like, let's take a step back. And like the thing that like we really just want you to take away from this meeting, I'm speaking as e-founder, is like that like we have a really simple and clear path into becoming a going concern. And here's like how it, we map like our unit economics to that, right? So explaining all those nuances in a pitch deck is really difficult. Um, again, like I think like the, the core principles of like distilling things down in sentences and all that stuff in the email deck is going to be important. You, again, there's, there's a little bit of progressive discovery here, but there's also some costs that you can play with. So some cost is actually one of my favorite economic concepts of, and I might be actually interpreting it the wrong way, but like the way I interpret it is actually what happened to me on Saturday. So I took my kids grocery shopping and I picked because an idiot, the, the longest line. I thought it was shortest at the time, it was longest. And there's some like old people in front of me and that's ages for me to say, but like they're taking forever, right? And so uh, like all these other lines around me 
were going faster and faster, right? All these people are getting checked out. And I was looking at them and I was like, should I leave? It's like, oh crap, I've already invested like three minutes into this line. I cannot leave, right? Sunk cost also plays into this founders, uh, this, this, um, this psychology as well as the VCs. The more time that you get VCs to spend with you and critically think about your company, the harder, the, the more and more that they're trying to champion it, I think, over time. Right? Like, I, that's kind of the more glasses half full perspective. Maybe some people have a very different perspective, like they're stringing me along or something. But if they're really spending time with you and you can get them across like a couple lines of just like the concept's exciting, the team seems exciting, not quite sure about the unit economics, but they, they sort of have like a, like a, like a, perspective right now and then and then you get them to like um later meetings where you can really walk through the nuances i believe just from some costs like i've already been so invested in trying to become your champion let's just get this done right so uh think about that again like i basically avoided your question but uh, hopefully there's something you can get from that just like a good bc would right <laughs> that's exactly right Okay, um, let's talk about uh, a couple of things that people are wondering if they should include in their deck. Um, the two that I'm seeing over and over again is one, their financials, financial models, um, financial like future finances, where they think the finances are going to go. Should they include those in both decks, one deck, um, not at all, and then also business model, is that important? Good, good question. So do not include it in any deck. So my thinking is that um, those are one of those things that become rat hole discussions where you're in a pitch deck and then they're like, wait, whoa, 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 what was this chart? Line 22 says this, like, that seems like kind of like an odd perspective on goodwill. Right. And, and you're like, uh, like, I don't want to have this tough discussion. Right. So the deck shouldn't include it as, at least at the seed stage. Now, if you're a growth stage company like series B or C, it becomes much more interesting. Like you literally could pitch a growth stage company, a series B or C with an Excel spreadsheet. It's just like, have your analysts look at these numbers and come back to us with money. <laughs> like there's nothing to say really, right? Um, <clears throat> in the case of Seed though, it's more about narrative and storytelling, right? You gotta actually walk people and get them excited about the vision more than anything else before you show them like the, the progressive discovery of the kitchen sink. And so where I believe the business model financials lie is actually in the data room. So you, you have like the artifacts, email deck, blurb, blurb email deck, long deck. And then um, at the right time, maybe after you do the full pitch in the meeting, with, uh, that's when you follow up with uh, a data room, a Dropbox, a box, whatever it is, Google Drive even, to that team that provides some of these details if it's been requested, okay? So like, I'm kind of speaking, I see like a question about like, are you saying like don't include like financials? And like, I like to look at that stuff, definitely, right? But I'm just saying don't provide it unless it's been solicited because I think it really rat holes. Now, because you know, financials at the seed stage and business model at the seed stage is a ridiculous concept, right? It's good to have a sense of like where you're heading. I, I don't dispute that. But do I think that there's gonna be micro pivots or even larger pivots or new things that you learn, especially at the seed stage before you hit product market fit? Absolutely, absolutely. And is that gonna affect your financials and your forecasting, your business model? Absolutely. So I'd rather not have those kinds of distracting conversations, at least at the seed stage from the founder's perspective, unless it's explicitly asked. Okay, and then a follow-up question to that, and this might have to be one of our last questions, but um, is in here in this list of questions, is the vision for the future of the company. Now, in a seed stage or pre-seed company, um, the vision for the future is like happening right now, right? Because they're right at the beginning of the company. But sure. um, in terms of like the long-term vision, should our founders be including that in their decks, both of them, just one of them? Uh, and if so, like how would you as an investor wanna see that information? So I think the future vision, um, I get a little bit nervous about this one as well. As my allergic reaction isn't as stark as like financials, like don't include that. But I also kind of feel the same way, which is like, it's great to have a perspective about where you're gonna be heading. And I want you to have that kind of clarity or at least a hypothesis about it, right? But it also can become a distraction because you don't want to commit to the hypothesis now since that there's so much learning and iteration to be done, right? I think that some of that future vision could exist in your total addressable market or market slide. You know, as you're making the case of like, we're here right now, it's a little bit more niche, but we're going into a, mac a more macro kind of market. That's where you can maybe insert a little bit more around like the future vision, right? But um, I think, it, again, like, uh, depending on the artifact. Like if it's like an email deck, I probably would not include it. 
if it's like the longer deck where you're in the room controlling the narrative, or at least actually previewing the narrative before you share the longer deck, it might be more appropriate, especially if it's been like explicitly discussed during the course of that meeting. Um, so hope I'll leave it, at that, leave it at that one. That's great, Eric. Thank you so much. And I know we just hit time and there are like 55 questions that we didn't get to. So those of you who we didn't answer your questions, I'm sorry. We'll try to answer some of them. Uh, and send you the responses um, if I can snag some of Eric's time later this week. Um, but thank you guys all so much for participating and for being here. And for Eric, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Thank you, Kara, for putting this together. And then a huge thank you to our, uh, the folks who came in and logged in today. I know you're very busy. You're taking time out, a lot, of, a lot of you from your sleep or from your work. And it really means a lot to our team that you gave us a chance to, to begin this kind of engagement with you. And hopefully this can turn into a relationship where we can work together as uh, founders and your VC. So if you ever uh, want to explore that further, we look at every single deal that's being sent to us at hustlefund.vc um, in that ingestion form that you can click on that says, where, what are you hustling? So please click that button and I very much hope that you give us the opportunity to learn more about you. So thank you so much for that. Bye all, take care.